Oh God, as we come before your word this morning, we pray that we would be reminded all over again of your good grace, your kindness, your undeserved love. May we be confronted all over again with what it is that we deserve and what it is that we get instead. We're humbled by these things, humbled by your grace, brought low by your kindness, and exalted in your love. May you be glorified this morning as we hear your word, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. A little bit of a roadmap for us this morning. We're going to be in part two of what we started last week, uh, Romans 9, uh, verses 24 to 29. And then next week, Josh Kelso will be finishing the book of James over the next two weeks, and then we'll be back in Romans for a little while. I want to read to us again Romans 9, 24 to 29. Paul writes, us prepared beforehand for glory, vessels of mercy, us whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but from among the Gentiles also. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who is not beloved, beloved. And it shall be in that place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and we would have resembled Gomorrah. This passage is all about what Jews and Gentiles learn from God's dealings with Israel. And we introduced the three sections of this last week. Number one, that God has a heart and a plan to save Gentiles. Verse 24, God called, that is effectively called people, unto salvation, not only from Jews, but also from Gentiles. And in verses 25 and 26, we learned that God saves contrary to merit. And he uses Israel as an example. He quotes from the book of Hosea, and he describes Israel's past, present, and future in Hosea, and Paul uses that as an illustration of God's heart towards sinners. That Israel, who was God's people, was so committed to her idols, so committed to saying, I don't want to belong to God, and God at one point said, okay, I'm not your God, and you're not my people. What a, what a tragic judgment and then God says to that same people, you who were not my people will be my people. And God makes the promise to Israel that he will one day bring about their restoration and repentance, a physical restoration and spiritual repentance. It's interesting that God says that those who are not his people will be called sons of the living God. That is a contrast to all the dead and false idols that they went after generation after generation. And we come to verses 27 and 29, and God continues using Israel as an illustration to promote this point. God keeps a remnant. That's what we'll be looking at this morning. God keeps a remnant. And what Jews and Gentiles learn from God's dealings with Israel is that God has and always does have a heart to keep a people for himself. And we're going to subdivide this last point into three points this morning. God keeps a remnant. Let's look together at verses 27 to 29. Paul says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and we would have resembled Gomorrah. God keeps a remnant. This text this morning is a series of quotations from the prophet Isaiah. Last week we looked at Hosea. Isaiah and Hosea were contemporaries. 
Uh, Isaiah primarily was a prophet to the southern tribes of Israel, although uh, much, much of his message goes beyond. Isaiah, like Hosea, was given children whose names would resemble and reflect Isaiah's prophetic ministry. You remember the unfortunate names that Hosea was to give his children. Isaiah had at least one better name. Um, Shear Jashub was the name of Isaiah's son. It may not quite have the ring to it you were thinking of for your next child, uh, but it has a good meaning. It means a remnant will return. It's a hopeful name rather than some of the other names prophets were given. And this morning, we're going to need to keep our finger in Isaiah as we examine this section of Romans. The first thing we want to see this morning in the reality that God keeps a remnant is that remnant theology is a message of both warning and hope. Remnant theology is a message of warning and hope. And a really interesting exercise sometime is to take out a concordance and your Bible and just look for the word remnant and trace it through the scriptures. See what God is doing with a remnant. There is a whole remnant theology in your Bible. And it is a theology that speaks not only to God's dealings with Israel, for whom that most often refers, but it speaks to the very heart of our God. And it is an encouragement to you and I when we're tempted to think we're the only ones being faithful. Student, if you are the only Christian student in your school, in your class, on your sports team, you need to have a remnant theology. You who are at work and you're the only believer you know in your office, you need to have a remnant theology. And you moms at home surrounded by those beautiful bundles of depravity, sometimes you need to have a remnant theology. <laughs> that you may feel alone and you're not really alone. Paul will pick up this theme later on in Romans 11 when he reminds us that God kept 7,000 Israelites who had not bowed the knee to Baal. This is a regular encouragement for those of us who want to walk faithfully with God and we're swimming upstream in a world that does not love God. Remnant theology, we must know, is a message, first of all, of warning and of hope. This is found in verse 27. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. And this is a quote of Isaiah 10:23. And, and Paul introduces the Isaiah quote with this formula. Isaiah cries out. Sometimes these introductory formulas are, as the scripture says, or as Isaiah says, or as it is written. But this one is, Isaiah cries out. And Paul invokes here Isaiah's urgency in his message. Uh, an urgency that was timely in Isaiah's day and timely in Paul's day timely in our day as well. And Paul, in fact, doesn't give a strict quotation of Isaiah 20, 10, 23. He conflates it uh, with Hosea 1, 10. That is the section of scripture he just quoted from up above. And so Paul still has Hosea on his mind and uses the introduction of Hosea 1, 10 and combines it with the second half of Isaiah 10, 23. And while Isaiah 10, 23 originally just says... Uh, though Israel be like the sand of the sea. Here, Paul uses Hosea's words, yes, the number of the sons of Israel will be as the sand of the sea. And in doing so, Paul is employing the words of the Old Testament to bring continuity between what he was just talking about of Israel's history in Hosea and combining it with the warning and the hope given from this quote from Isaiah chapter 10. And this text is really important for us to understand individual generational and national hope for Israel. Individual, generational, and national hope for Israel. You'll remember that Israel was given multiple covenants. One of those was a conditional covenant, the Mosaic covenant. That is, it was based on conditions. You obey me and you'll be blessed. You disobey me and you'll be cursed. And even that conditional covenant came with unconditional realities. God knew what Israel would do. And in the Mosaic Covenant, when God gave promises for obedience and cursings for disobedience, uh, 
God said, I know you will disobey me and I will exile you out of your land. Then I will bring you back and I will give you new hearts. <laughs> All of that is in the conditional Mosaic covenant. And it's just great to see the heart of God, even when he holds out conditions for blessing, to tie that to unconditional promises of his initiating love and sovereign grace. And then, of course, God gives unconditional covenants to Israel too. Promise of that seed that would crush the head of the snake that would come through Eve, down through Israel, down through a Davidic line to produce a king to sit on a throne forever. Promises of an earthly kingdom and physical blessing, and of course, the promises of the new covenant to Israel, new heart, and a love for God's law. All of that is coming. But we need to understand that God's promises to Israel can be seen on an individual footing, a generational footing, and a national footing. Any individual Israelite could be saved and know God personally and go to heaven. And the basis of salvation for an Old Testament believer in Israel or otherwise was always by grace alone through faith alone. And of course, the payment for sin would be by Christ alone, although yet only preached in shadows and types and figures before Christ came. So an Israelite in the Old Testament would have to entrust himself to Yahweh and trust God's provision for a substitute sacrifice of sin. And that was done, of course, through the sacrificial system where innocent animals would have their throats slit, blood spilt, an animal killed as a visible symbol of that's what I deserve and an innocent substitute died in my place, all of it pointing to Christ who would do the actual payment for those sins. But an individual Israelite could not only be saved and go to heaven, but also experience the temporal blessings promised under that conditional covenant. And any given generation of Israelites could experience something of a national blessing in their generation for the pursuit of the Lord. And, and you saw that in Israel's history, a waxing and waning of blessing based on their love for Yahweh, loyalty to Yahweh. You saw that in the cycle of the judges and God's rescue. You saw that in David's life and Solomon's era, the golden age of Israel's prosperity because there was a king after God's own heart. You saw that at times in subsequent kings with the recovery of God's word and a stay of judgment, but all of that, of course, culminating in Assyrian and Babylonian exile as the nation kept reverting to idolatry on a national level, generational level, and being removed from the land. But there is also a national salvation promised to Israel that is yet future. Paul is building towards that argument. We'll get to that in Romans 11. But all through that, all through Israel's history, there is the concept of a remnant, a remnant being saved. And remnant is simply a remainder, that which is left over, a small minority amongst the masses that God takes credit for preserving. The doctrine of the remnant is those who remain faithful to Yahweh by God's grace. And so the concept of a remnant being saved is a message, and it's a message both of warning and of hope. The warning is this, you don't get in by default. No Israelite got to go to heaven simply for being an Israelite. No Israelite got to be blessed simply for being an Israelite. You don't earn the favor of God by your lineage because you're of a certain race. In fact, every, account, every individual is accountable to God for sin. And this idea is all throughout Scripture, not just in terms of God's dealing with Israel and a remnant, but in terms of a narrow path and a broad path. You know that the gate to eternal life is narrow, Jesus said, and few are those who find it. The way is broad, the path is large that leads to destruction, and many are those that find it. Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and they'll say all the things they did 
that they thought they had some allegiance to God, some allegiance even to Christ, and Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And no sinner gets into heaven by being born in the right family or by going to the right church, by being part of the right culture, by having the right kind of parents. You see, many Jews believed that they were entitled to God's favor. And much of the book of Romans is a clear explanation of the gospel that destroys any such notions. The uh, theology of a remnant does away with this kind of idea that you're just in because of who you are. My wife Janet is reading a biography of Selina Hastings, Countess of Huntingdon. She was a woman of English nobility class in the late 1700s, and she became a behind-the-scenes support, theologically, financially, and in much encouragement, of the first great awakening in England and then in America. And she was often listening to and inviting countless others to listen to the preaching of the gospel in open-air preaching in a time where the churches had mostly forgotten it. Now, this was the era of John and Charles Wesley. We sing some of their hymns and of George Whitfield, the great first great awakening preacher in America. She received a letter from the Duchess of Buckingham. Uh, you might recognize that name. Her husband financed the construction of Buckingham Palace. She was a lady of much importance. Selina Hastings had invited the Duchess to listen to the gospel being preached in these open-air meetings. The Duchess replied in a letter, I thank your ladyship for the information concerning the Methodist preachers, speaking of uh, John and Charles Wesley. Their doctrines are most repulsive. They are strongly tinctured with impertinence and disrespect towards their superiors in perpetually endeavoring to level all ranks and do away with all distinctions. It is monstrous to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that crawl on the earth. This is highly offensive and insulting, and I cannot but wonder that your ladyship would relish any sentiments so much at variance with high rank and good breeding. I apologize that I could not do that in a nice British accent with a cup of tea. <laughs> but this idea that one would think him or herself above the hoi polloi and somehow deserving of God's favor because of who they were, because of social status, because of class, rank, ethnicity, or anything else, is a tragic, satanic deception that keeps people from life and the good news of the gospel. Depravity levels all ranks, and God's grace in the gospel levels all ranks. We all have that heart. We are all in need of the same rescue by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the theology of the remnant is a warning, a warning primarily to Israel, to Jews that a remnant is saved. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, the remnant is saved. Now, there are times when this number, the, like the sand of the sea, is used to demonstrate a promise that God will actually preserve Israel and repopulate the nation. Sometimes it's held out positively. Sometimes in the Old Testament, it's held out as a concession. Even though that number is like the sand of the sea, a remnant will be saved. And there are times when people who are descendant of Israel's forefathers, recipients of promises, the, the great rich root of the olive tree. There are times when very few Israelites love God. Very few embrace eternal life through God's promises. That will not always be their state. That will not always be the proportion but this theology of a remnant is a warning. It's more than that. It's also a message of hope. It is the promise that some actually will be saved. And, and notice the word saved there in verse 27. Paul has changed Isaiah's wording. Isaiah has the word return 
uh, and Paul changes it to will be saved. And, and the Hebrew word return in Isaiah is the word for to turn or return. It's a word often used for repentance. It can describe a spiritual turning accompanying genuine salvation. But it can also refer to geography. I'm going to return home from vacation or return from the exile in Babylon and Assyria. The return was often equated with that return from Babylonian and Assyrian exile for Egypt, I mean for Israel. But Paul wants to make clear that what he has in mind here is a return to the Lord, a return to Yahweh. And while Isaiah portrays both a physical return from exile into the land, he also, in many cases, demonstrates a future return from a future exile into the land, accompanied by a national spiritual return to Yahweh in repentance. And we don't have time this morning to read the entirety of the book of Isaiah. I would commend it to you. But I would like to look at a couple of highlights. You read Isaiah chapter 1. And God cries out against his people. Alas, verse 4, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned Yahweh. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from him. Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? In other words, God is saying, what do I have to do to get your attention? Now, what a tragedy. Isaiah cries out, verse 11, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says Yahweh? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires you of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. End of verse 13, I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. Verse 15, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Now, God is actually the one that required of them sacrifices. It's good to pray. And yet Israel sacrificed over and over and over again with no heartfelt loyalty to Yahweh. They were two-timing. They went through the motions religiously, and yet they were living for the world, for a world of idols, a world for false gods, and a world of sin. Look down at verse 27 of chapter 1. Uh, actually, look at verse 18. God invites them graciously, compassionately, in spite of their sin. Come now, let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. What a remarkable, undeserved offer. And then God makes a promise, verse 27, Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. Look down in chapter 2. Now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it and many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion by the way, Zion is God's affectionate term for Jerusalem. In Isaiah 1, we're going to see this in a few moments, God calls Israel Sodom. But here in his promise for the future, he calls Jerusalem Zion. Everywhere that's used, God, that's God's term of endearment for the beloved city. It's a term of grace. The law will go forth from Zion and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem and he will judge between the nations. He will render decisions for the peoples and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. Verse 
What a remarkable set of promises. It's just like what we looked at in Hosea last week, that accompanying Israel's spiritual national renewal in keeping with God's purpose and promise is a coming era of world peace, of physical prosperity, and of Israel's unfeigned loyalty to God. Listen, these are things only God could bring about. Who could turn a heart devoted to idols into a heart that looks like this? Only God by his sovereign grace. These are the same things that Paul will get us to in Romans 11. Secondly, this morning, we need to see that remnant theology is grounded in the purpose of God. Remnant theology is grounded in the purpose of God. This takes us to verse 28 of Romans 9. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. This is a quote of Isaiah 10, 23. Paul is continuing Isaiah's argument. For a complete destruction, one that is decreed, says Isaiah, the Lord Yahweh of hosts will execute in the midst of the whole land. And I would give my translation of Isaiah 10, 23 this way. For the Lord Yahweh of hosts will accomplish in the midst of the whole earth a completion and a determined end. Remnant theology is grounded in the purpose of God, and, and God's purpose is both to save and to judge. And the accomplishment of God's purpose is what is in view in Romans 9, 28. In, in the quote from Isaiah 20, 10, 23, God is called the, the Lord Yahweh of hosts, and hosts is simply the word for armies, uh, sometimes armies of angels, sometimes armies of stars. Uh, the point there is that God has armies. The God of the universe has armies of supernatural beings at his disposal. And the Lord of the universe can command the stars to obey him. He can command legions of angels to accomplish his purposes. He has done it in past history. He has leveled nations that way. And he will do it again in future history. Just read the book of Revelation and see how God employs his angels to bring about his judgment. The New American Standard says that God will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. The ESV has fully and without delay. This represents two words in the Greek text. The first is to complete something that has been expected. Here's something that has been in process, it has been expected, and now it is brought to completion. And the second word is to put a limit to something, to cut it short. Another way to say to bring it to its end. All of this is to say that God will do his work and it will be quick, decisive, effective, complete, and final. God will not wait forever. God will not be patient forever. His purpose to judge and his purpose to save, his purpose to vindicate his own name will be done quickly. He will not endure the rebellion of man forever. God will not prolong his undeserved patience. Remember that in the days leading up to the flood, God said, my spirit will not strive with man forever. And because of man's rebellion, he wiped out the entire population of humanity except for eight people. In what sense are God's acts of judgment and salvation and vindication done quickly? In what sense are they done quickly for the unbeliever? Well, I think they're done quickly for the unbeliever who is caught up in temporal distractions. Uh, the one who's not tied to Christ is tied to the world. Tied to the world's things, the world's schedules, the world's priorities. Whatever is next that brings me pleasure, that brings me delight, whatever it is that I want, it is an absorption with self. It is the worship of the altar of the idolatry of pleasure and of self-love. And the world is just occupied with the world's things. I heard a sports news commentator this week say out loud on the radio, I don't like to think about death. 
Because if I think about it too long, I realize that everybody dies and then that's it. And who wants to think about that? I need to think about other things. That's why I've given my life to the study of sports. <laughs> what an admission. He knows he's going to die. And for him, if he does not turn, the Lord's judgment, salvation, and vindication acts will come quickly, suddenly, unexpectedly. You know, if you're delinquent on your taxes, you say something like, it's April 15th already? <laughs> Did somebody move the calendar? Did this accelerate? What happened? If you're a student, the, the midterm exam is today? It came suddenly, quickly. It, it, it wasn't any faster than was scheduled. It came right on time. But it seems sudden and quick to those not prepared. In Noah's day, they were marrying and giving in marriage. Sodom and Gomorrah faced a sudden, unexpected destruction. And when King Jesus returns, the unbelieving world will be caught unawares and unprepared. And it's easy to understand the lack of preparation. We understand the principle in Ecclesiastes 8.11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are given more fully to do evil. If you don't get immediate consequences for your crimes, you're going to pile up more crimes. The truth is, God's patience is assumed to be his non-existence. Or his patience is assumed to be his tolerance. Or his patience is assumed to be his endorsement. And the reality is, Romans 2.24 makes it clear that men are storing up God's wrath against themselves for the day of his wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. And the illustration Jonathan Edwards gave to explain Romans 2.24 is the patience of God is like a great earthen dam holding back a large body of water and every time a sinner sins, he's throwing more water behind the dam thinking that it's safe there. The dam will burst, God's wrath will be unleashed and the sinner will be swallowed up by it. That patience, that kindness is not a tolerance of sin. It is not a letting bygones be bygones. It is a waiting for a day of reckoning. It is also indeed the patience of God waiting for people to repent, giving people an opportunity to believe, to turn, to find mercy while there is still time. In what sense are God's acts of judgment, salvation, and vindication done quickly for the believer? For the believer who lives her life waiting, enduring hardship, physical, emotional trials that aren't changing, circumstances that won't yield. For a believer facing the same difficulty day in and day out, crying out in prayer, how long, O Lord? How does this come quickly for Christians all around the world today under persecution? How is the Lord's work in this verse done quickly? Well, it, it's quick in terms of the eternal scale of things. Right? If we do the math on how big eternity is compared to how long this life is, we understand that the Lord's return is quick. It will come soon. In fact, very soon, we will have been longer at home in heaven in the presence of our Savior than we will have been here. And it will be worth the wait. In Romans 9, 28, Paul appeals to the doctrine of the remnant from Isaiah to uphold the truth that God accomplishes salvation and judgment precisely for his glory, according to his sovereign purpose. Notice what he says. The Lord will execute his word. This is his thing, his matter, 
on the earth. He will finish his purpose. He will execute his plan. He will get glory, and he will get glory as both a savior and judge. The doctrine of the remnant reminds us that salvation is of the Lord and that judgment is of the Lord. The promise of hope and the promise of judgment are held out before humanity so that God can put his own purpose on display. This takes us back to what we looked at a couple of months ago in Romans 9, that God prepares vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath. The purpose of this judgment, the purpose of grace, the purpose of election is all to bring about the glory of God as God. And it builds on this argument through Romans, culminating at the end of Romans 11. God dispenses judgment and mercy so that Romans eleven thirty six 36 can be said that from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. There's a coming day when those who are saved by God's grace will not say, oh, I'm of the nation of Israel. I deserve to be here. They won't. They will say, I was cut off for unbelief and God in his kindness and his mercy grafted us back in again. I don't belong here. And there's coming a day when Gentiles will say, I was a wild olive outside of the garden. I wasn't part of the promises. I wasn't part of the people. And God crafted me in by his grace. What am I doing here? And we'll all cry out, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unfathomable his mercy. Remnant theology is a promise of undeserved mercy. Last point, verse 29. And Paul here quotes Isaiah again. Unless Yahweh of hosts Isaiah 1.9, had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom, we would be like Gomorrah. And Paul says it this way, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and we would have resembled Gomorrah. Sabaoth, you see that in the New American Standard, it gets translated in other versions, is just the Hebrew word for armies, for hosts. Again, God is invoking his power, his sovereign over the universe, his commander of armies to demonstrate his authority to accomplish this amazing purpose. And if God had not left to us a posterity, unless Yahweh of hosts had left us few survivors, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. Why the comparison to Sodom and Gomorrah? What is it that happened to those two great human cities? They were leveled. No citizens escaped. Absolute extinction, obliteration, no trace. Those cities and the surrounding communities were wiped off the face of the earth and they stand today as a monument to God's judgment for all of humanity to see. They stand in the annals of history of God's judgment against sin and how quickly we forget. And why would God compare his people, Israel, to Sodom and to Gomorrah? Well, because it's what they deserve. Look at Isaiah 1.10. This is Isaiah to Israel. Right after he says, unless Yahweh of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom and we would be like Gomorrah. Hear the word of Yahweh, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Citizens of Sodom and citizens of Gomorrah have not been resurrected in order to hear this prophetic utterance. God is name-calling, and he's calling his own people by those dirty names because it's what they deserve. It's not the only time the Bible does that, in fact. Um, Isaiah 1.10 is not alone. In the book of Revelation, Revelation 11.8, God talks about the two witnesses uh, who will give prophetic utterance during the great tribulation. They will be uh, untouchable. 
as they fulfill God's prophetic ministry then. Uh, God will again speak through the mouths of prophets and they will speak judgment and hope to a watching world during that time. The world will hate them, try to kill them. And when their ministry is done, God will allow them to be killed. In Revelation eleven eight, their dead bodies will lie in the street and the great city, which is mystically called, pneumatically called, spiritually called, is called Sodom and Egypt. Well, which one is it? Uh, my, my geography is a little poor. Is it, are, are those the same thing? Are they in the same place? No, the, the, again, God is name calling. How do we know he's talking about Jerusalem? Because he says, where also their Lord was crucified. And God again calls Jerusalem. Sometimes he calls it Zion, the city of my love. And here he calls it Egypt and Sodom. And the doctrine of the remnant says this, had God not preserved a posterity, Israel would have ceased to exist. If they had gotten what they deserved, there would be no Israel. There would be no Israelites. There would be no descendants, no seed, no posterity. The simple existence of ethnic Israel to this day, despite Israel's penchant for idolatry and rebellion, and despite the history of Israel's enemies who have attempted to exterminate them time and again, their very existence is a testament to God's promise of a remnant. In Romans 9.28, the word posterity is the Greek word for seed and, and this is intentional in the Apostle Paul. The seed promise is a promise of restoration, of spiritual revival, of promises kept. And I want you to see this in Isaiah. We're gonna skip it. Uh, Isaiah 1, 27, Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, Isaiah 2, 11 to 12, and then really throughout the rest of the book, the, the whole book is about God's coming judgment and his restoration for the nation. You see, what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah is what we all deserve. It's what we all deserve, not just Israel, not just God's nation that was committed to idolatry. This is unconditional election or just grace unmerited grace, undeserved love. Out of love, God takes the initiative with sinful, rebellious creatures. It was sovereign goodness that saved any Israelites, just as it is sovereign goodness that saves any Gentiles. Thomas Schreiner writes, no one can legitimately complain that the preservation of a remnant justifies a complaint against God. The saving of any is mercy. Those who grumble against a God who refuses to save, those who grumble against a God who refuses to save all, reveal that they believe that God should save all. And that salvation is not a merciful gift of God, but a necessary part of God's contractual obligations to human beings. In this kind of theology, praise will shrivel up because no one is thankful when God merely gives what he should. It's the fundamental difference between grace and works, between merit and faith. Does God love the undeserving and rescue the sinner? Or does God have to give you what you earned? The truth is, if we got what we'd earned, we would all be as Sodom and Gomorrah. We would all be in a lake of fire for all of eternity. It is only by grace, only by undeserved mercy, only on account of God's initiating love that anybody is saved. Another commentator says this, unconditional election of individuals to eternal life, that doctrine against which such objections are raised by many, Far from being contrary to the ideas we ought to entertain for the goodness of God, it is so entirely consistent with the goodness of God that except for election, not one of the nation of Israel would have ever been saved. Thus, the doctrine of election, very far from being in any degree harsh or cruel, as many who misunderstand it affirm, is, as we see here, a glorious demonstration of divine goodness and love. Had it not been for this election, election, 
through which God had before prepared vessels of mercy unto glory. Neither Jew nor Gentile would have escaped, but all would have remained vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. That is the theology of a remnant. Unless the Lord of hosts had kept for himself a posterity, had saved for himself by grace sinners for his own glory, we would all be helpless, hopeless, dead forever. God, it is your name we praise. It is you we give all the glory. Truly from you and through you and to you are all things. You are the savior of sinners. Your grace abounds to people who do not deserve it, who could never earn it, who were not even looking for it. Oh Lord, we were spiritually dead when you made us alive, granted us faith, gave us repentance, opened our eyes, shined in our hearts the light of the gospel that we might embrace your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have prepared us to be in your presence forever. Until then, until you come, O oh Lord, make us faithful to be a light to the world, to proclaim this saving grace to all who would hear. And would you be pleased to continue to raise up many, our friends, family members, coworkers, neighbors, to the truth that you have brought us to, to the love that we know. In Jesus' name, amen.